linked up today um, for that kind of sharing questions, uh, sharing inspirations. Yeah, let us uh, have time to share together today. So the floor is open. Okay, all of you guys are waiting for Revival Week. I have a question. I have a question. Praise the name of the Lord. Yesterday uh, at church, we had a teaching on money and money. Money is connected with work. Um, we live in times where work where, where work is defined as a job and uh, unemployment levels are so high. There are so many people who have got qualifications, but the jobs are not forthcoming. And even the few who are able to get the jobs, the money is really not commensurate with the efforts, even the costs that they, uh, that they, they, they expend, you know, in doing the job. And it's more of a cycle. Uh, so people have actually gotten into a mode of what has been termed as the struggle, the struggle to survive. So really my question would be, uh, how would we advise somebody who is in that category? Someone who really wants to make the money who has actually uh, strived to secure the skills, but the opportunity for a job is not available. Even when it's available, the money is too little to go around. What advice can we give that person? Okay, um, I don't want to preempt some of the things I've prepared to teach. Work is one of those things that uh, is going to be in that series that we began yesterday. Um, but um, suffice it for me to say that um, <laughs> it was Miles Munro. Let me just quote Miles Munro on this one. Miles Munro, the late Miles Munro, always, always said that having a job will never make you rich. It doesn't matter how much it's paying you. Uh, if you're doing very well from the job you have, then that means that you should be much richer than that. Uh, basically, Miles Munro said that we need to find our callings and execute those callings because usually your calling will align to respond to problems that people have. And when you begin solving people's problems, people will pay you to, so for solving those problems. Now, when I mention calling, most of you, your brains have run very quickly to apostle, teacher, elder, whatever, evangelist. That's not what I'm talking about. When God created each and every one of us, there was a purpose for which God created you that should be blessing other people, that should be lifting up other people, that should be solving other people's problems. You need to find what that calling is. Usually it will manifest in a talent. Usually it will manifest in something that you're pretty good to do, that you're one of the best people that are good at that thing. So I would encourage you to find that and start doing it alongside your job. And over time, that will grow to even provide more money to you than your job. For some people, they find it early and that's what they do for life and they grow wealthy. So for me, that's what I would say about that for now. Um, let's be creative, let's be out there working. Cool, guys, ask your questions. Sorry, Mama Ana, so you've unmuted, go ahead. Praise God. Amen. I just want to add to what you've just said, that uh, working is just according to your attitude and your definition. Otherwise, there is work always. 
um, the best way to get to work is to identify the needs of that particular area where you stay or where you are. Then think of how you will meet that need. Praise God. If I'll give an example, if you are staying in a place where everyone is using a charcoal stove, the, then there is high demand for charcoal. So the solution is for you, you get the capital of a sack of charcoal and start meeting that need. So the, these are the jobs of applying. It will be difficult to get them. But when you sit down, you can find out if you are near school, you will know that snacks sell. And you'll examine yourself and see what the best snack you can do. And then start like that. But always it's good to have the ideal job you want. Maybe you want a restaurant, but don't expect to start at a restaurant level or to work in Sheraton or what, but you start with as little capital as you, as you can get. And then you walk into your calling, into your goal. Me, that's the best, the, few, the people I have seen who have succeeded in always putting something on the table are people who have met people's needs. Don't look at high class needs. The, the money comes from the smallest people because the highest population of Ugandans are below poverty level or average there. And these are people, if, for example, many people can't afford a kilo of meat. So what has come up? You turn every corner, they are roasting, they, are, they put a few pieces on a stick and they are selling. And that's how some people are getting meat. They don't. And you find someone is making a saucepan of porridge at every corner. Why? Some many people, young people, they are jobless, but they always work and maybe get 2,000, 3,000. So you can always take a cup of porridge and go to bed. So I think that's where I wish I would start that you look for need in the particular area where you don't involve transport and then you, you use what you have as a basis. If I'm staying in a, 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 a what, in Chiganda, I don't need to rent a shop to roast cassava or to roast maize or to cut fene, you know, or to fry kabalagala. I think if we start like that, then first of all, we, we shall not have jobless people, but then we shall have people who want now to improve from where they have started from. I think that's my take on it, that start from zero. I remember when I have just started working, I had to improvise. The money was, money will never be enough by the way however much they increase our salary. So I had to make chapatis at, at 4 a.m. and go with them to, to office so that I can sell. Because I saw they used to serve us tea, but we know it. So me, I started making chapatis and boiling eggs and going with them to the office. So let's think, let's use our brains to think and innovate something according to the surroundings we are in. Um, that's my take. Thank you, Mama Florence. I saw Pastor Edward Tucker's hand up. I don't know whether he wanted to say something. Go ahead, Pastor Tucker. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mama Wanasho, for your contribution. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Paul. Um, yes, yesterday, I want to welcome you back from yesterday's Sunday service as uh, Pastor Paul was taking us through uh, wow, that's hot, hot, hot sermon. And uh, it, it took me back to HSC, the economic class, economics class, I remember. You know, economics 
when it's like you came up with a question and you asked us in church, what is economics? What is an economy? Economics, something like that. Wow. So I also want to pose a question to you, sir, uh, Mr. Kenya. I, you know, every good worker pays. Uh, okay, is uh, uh, if someone uh, offers uh, to work for you, you need to, yeah, it's good to pay him. So every good work deserves a good pay. So my question is: is uh, payment only in monetary terms, or you can do payments in a different way? So I wanted to know what's with payment? Is payment only in monetary terms, or is the, or, or, or there is a different way we can we can pay, or so someone can be paid? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Taka. I think the obvious answer to that is that you can always be paid in any other way. However, there is always the agreed medium of transaction which somebody can take and translate it into whatever form they want to gain a benefit out of their energy. What do I mean? The reason you have legal tender, which is what we call money, is that if I go and I give you five hours of my work to do whatever it is you want me to do for you, you translate my energy into that legal tender, you give it to me, and for me I go, if I want to buy a bed sheet, I buy it. If I want to just go and eat a chikarai, I eat it. If I want to just go and add another course of bricks to my foundation, I do that. Uh, and that's the, <clears throat> the beauty and the value of legal tender. It gives you the latitude to expend your energy and then be paid for it and then use it to get whatever else you need. The problem with uh, paying in uh, non-monetary terms is that uh, how do you know what my need is? So if you're going to pay that way, it must be mutually agreed. I know people, one of my uh, friend's fathers is a lawyer but he did so many cases for people and the area where they used to stay, at that point in time, people didn't have a lot of money, but there was a lot of cases. So they often paid him in terms of cows. They paid him in terms of land. Uh, those were the common things that they used to. Uh, when they sold coffee, then they had a bit of money. But I want to tell you that after a while, he had so much land in that area and beyond that literally he has lived his old age off of that so uh, however he never forced people to pay like that people always told him mze i don't have but can i give you uh, an acre of land can i give you uh, chikumi kuchikumi so it yes it can work <clears throat> i've had people if there's the, that's what in economics you have something called butter trade or in commerce you know you, you're paying one item for another. You remember in the, in the book of Genesis, when uh, Joseph saw that dream of Pharaoh, when Pharaoh brought Joseph in as a consultant to advise him, what did Joseph tell him? Let the people bring 20% of their harvest every time they harvest. It translated into huge stores of grain. Later, when the people came and the hunger had started, they started paying with cash. Then they paid with their cows. Then the cows got finished. Then they started paying with their land. The land got finished. Then what did they pay with? You remember they said, we are giving ourselves as your slaves. So they paid with their own lives to Pharaoh and enslaved themselves to Pharaoh as slaves. So I think the long answer to your question, Pastor Taka, is the one I have given, but yeah, it can be, you can use other terms, but they have to be mutually agreed. About Uganda, today we are free sharing. Those who have questions are asking them, and you found those who joined late, you found that uh, the question that had been asked was about money, it was about work, and so that's where we started so far. We've had three comments about that but you can ask a question about anything uh, or you can add a contribution about anything. Even a testimony, by the way, is welcome. 
As we wait for people to bring their contributions, I hope you all remember we are starting Revival Week on Wednesday. Apostle Atria is going to be with us. It would be good for you to invite people, your friends, your neighbors, and basically the meetings start at 5 to 7 p.m. We really need people to attend this well. Okay, unmute your microphone, somebody, and uh, share with us something. Uganda. Can I begin now choosing? Let me now see who I can choose. Um, Kato Benston. Tell us something. Tell us something, Kato Benson. Okay. Praise God, Pastor. Amina. Yes, my question is, Pastor, what's the right way of seeking God? What's the right, right way of seeking God? Of seeking God. And if, yes, and part B of it is if Jesus is in us, are we supposed to seek him because he's in us? Mm. Okay, that's an interesting question, Kato, and thank you for it. Um, I will ask a rather naughty question to help us understand what my answer will be. What is the right way to find somebody to marry and to get them interested in your proposal? I am asking that question to everyone. I'm being told Kato is unmarried. He, he shouldn't answer those questions, but I think he can answer the question because he's of marriageable age. Uh, plus everyone else on this forum can answer the question. But maybe um, the same, the, the, the reason I'm asking that question is that seeking God is akin to that kind of relationship. There is no formula in my view, but it is a heart um, to heart thing. When God is getting close to us, I'm reminded of a scripture that God told Israel, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. And I think James or oh, First John, one of those books, quotes that specific scripture. And um, then, you know, there's this common verse that exploits uses in Daniel 11, that they that know their God shall be strong and they shall do great and mighty exploits. When you read that chapter, it is interesting how that verse falls into that chapter out of the blue almost, because the chapter is talking about two kings. One king was a strong king, I think from either the north, I think it was the north, and he used to fight often with the southern king and defeat him. But after a while, the southern king, the Bible says, started corrupting the people around, the nations around, he would flatter them, he would give them gifts, and basically he would corrupt them. And after a while, the Bible says the people's hearts turned toward him, and then he launched his attack on the northern king when he was still sleeping. For him, he couldn't see what this guy was doing. And he finally defeated him, and he defeated him so badly that he could not, <clears throat> um, he could not recover. And the Bible says that um, that's where that verse now comes in and says that almost in a sense, I forget word for word what it says, almost like the weak people will be defeated by flatteries, but they that know their God shall be strong and they shall do great and mighty exploits. Now, when I was reading one time, I realized and um, went back to read that word knowing God. It is the same word used in Genesis chapter 4 when the Bible says, and Adam knew his wife Eve, and she gave birth to um, Seth, the third child of Adam, who was called Seth. Um, I'm just using those words for you to understand that the same knowing that Adam knew Eve is the same knowing, the sense in which you expected to know God. Of course, God is not physical. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So that means that um, seeking God has a lot more to do with relationship, with creating environment that God loves to be in, 
Yesterday, I connoted the verse that we always quote that uh, God inhabits the praises of his people. You, when you read in the book of Chronicles, um, how Solomon prepared for the launch of the temple and uh, with, with, with smart preparations, getting the musicians and the singers to sing with one voice. And he put in a lot of sacrifice. And finally, when he launched on that day, the Bible says the presence of God came and by reason of it, the ministers in the temple could not even minister. It overrode them. So why am I giving you all these examples? You can begin to see that these men had a relationship. When you look at uh, um, our father, Abraham, what does the Bible say? Abraham came with his father, um, uh, Terah, from Ur of the Chaldees. And the Bible says the reason they left Ur of the Chaldees his father was, was going to Canaan. But then when he gets to a place called Terah, he stops. And I think he loved the scenery there and he never continued on his journey. And he ends up dying there. And the Bible says, as soon as he died, God tells Abraham, can you get up and go to a land that I will show you? For me, which tells me that something had told Abraham's father, God had told Abraham's father to go to Canaan and his father lost vision. When he dies, God picks up on Abraham and Abraham becomes responsive. When God tells him things, he does them. When God tells him move, he moves. When, uh, you know, and after a while, God starts now revealing secrets to him. He starts telling him secrets. You remember yesterday we talked about we being friends because the secrets that Jesus speaks from the father, he now gives to us. So God begins to tell Abraham secrets. Whenever he would tell Abraham secrets, Abraham would respond. Secrets, he would respond. And finally, the Bible says, God tells Abraham, I am coming to make a covenant with you. Abraham prepares a sacrifice and makes sure that it is not consumed by anything else until God himself finally comes. And he begins now promising him, telling him about how his descendants would be many, how they would go in slavery, how they would come out in strength and power, and many other things. I have gone again giving a lengthy answer, but it has so many faces to it, saying that there is no formula to seeking God. Every time somebody tries to create a formula, just know that uh, another religion is about to develop. Yeah, but there's no formula. What God is looking for, for from us is relationship. The men and women that have won the heart of God have understood that. David understood God loved relationship. He understood the secret of worship and he worshiped God until God could not forget his name. When God rejected Saul, he told the prophet, I have chosen a man for myself who's after my own heart. You see what the statement of God says? That a man after my own heart. So for me, seeking God is about a personal relationship with God. You need to find what that means in your life and pursue it and grow it. That is a process of seeking God. And in as far as I'm concerned, there is no formula to it. Find what the God loves and pursue those things and we'll see if you won't find him because he will find you before you even find him. Okay, that was Kato. Thank you very much for that question. Any others, questions, comments? testimonies um yes kato go ahead <clears throat> yes there was part to be of it eh? if god is nice now why do we seek him is it was it stopped in the old testament or still in the new testament because in the new testament they say that god is nice now mm. why do we seek him when okay i think when you read the bible at times you need to look at the bigger picture in the book of Acts, there is that verse where I think it is right at the point when Peter is speaking to a certain group of people and he says, in him we live and move and have our being. Meaning, once you have said God is in us, there is also an aspect of you being in God. Okay? Um, uh, but then you also... You remember that verse that I love a lot that I almost quoting from Hebrews chapter four, which says that we have a great high priest in Jesus Christ who is now seated 
uh, at the right hand of the Father, but he is also ministering in the temple in heaven. And it says that let us therefore approach the throne of mercy and obtain grace and mercy for help in time of need. Okay, then I would ask a question. If God is already in you, why are you approaching the throne of mercy? So the point I'm making here is God is everywhere. Yeah, he is in you, he's everywhere. But when we talk about seeking God, it is about relationship. Yeah, it is one thing for you to be in God and another thing for, you, for, for God to know you by name and begin talking about you the way he identified David. You know? So it is not the death of Jesus that causes God to be close or for God to be among people. Because when you read the Old Testament, you, see, you read stories of like the spirit of God was on Samson. The spirit of God was on Moses. The spirit of God was on Joshua. When the spirit of God is on somebody, what does that mean? That is God being in us as well. But the, the difference in my view is that seeking God has more to do with building relationship. You know, again, there is that verse that I gave to us um uh, recently that became the theme of what we are doing this year it says that he that dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide in the shadow of the almighty what does it mean are there people who are not dwelling in the secret place of course that's what the verse is telling you isn't god everywhere we have just seen he's everywhere so what is that secret place? It comes back down to relationship. So much as God can be in you, you've accepted Jesus. Um, when, when the message of the church, one of the churches, I think, um, uh, the, is it the first message of the churches in Revelations there? When he says, behold, I am at the door knocking. If you shall open your door, I shall walk in and we shall sup together. We shall eat together. Remember that those messages were to people who were already born again. So what was Jesus doing in, at the heart of a born again person knocking at that heart, at the door of the heart, waiting for that born again person to open for him? So there is an element about God that requires a relationship. The fact that you accepted Jesus does not permanently mean that you have earned, um, for lack of a better expression, a visa that is irrevocable. Yes, you have the grace available to enter as you will. That is why the temple tent was, I mean, uh, curtain was torn in two, that you might freely access the Holy of Holies. That is the essence of that. But because that access is there, it doesn't mean that everyone uses it. When you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, that access is availed to you. The presence of God is availed to you. His presence is with you and you're in his presence. But then when you start talking about seeking God, you're talking about moving your relationship with God to another level that is personal. I don't know whether that clarifies anything for you. Hello, am I talking to myself? <laughs> Okay, I have seen Kato's sign. He's now talking sign language. Okay, any other questions, comments, sharing, testimony? Praise God. Amina. I was uh, asked a question today. Mm. But I want us to share so that I get more, more answers. Because this person is a is a, a mature Christian, but she said that why should why should we ask God for what we need when He always need when He already knows that we need it? That is it is it important to go to God and ask for what you need? But the word of God says he already knows that we need it. So shouldn't he just supply us with whatever we need? 
Okay. So I want us to discuss. Maybe there are many people who think like that. Thank you, Mama Florence. Let me open it up if somebody has an answer before I say anything to that. Uh, Madina, are you answering to that question? Uh, Thanks, Amen. Are you answering the question Mama Florence asked? Yes. Okay. Yes, we should. All right. I think we have to know that in the presence of God, we are His. We are His children. Like the teaching of First Paragraph, we we are His children. We are no longer slaves. So if you know you are a child of God. You should always ask your child in the world if you want something you have to ask. Okay, thank you, Madina. Yes, um, I also have something to add. Eh? Um, I think in that uh, why won't God work directly in our lives, despite the fact that he knows our needs. I think it for me, I think it's because when God made us, he gave us free will. And because God, for God, for every any entity in the spiritual realm, whether it's God or the devil, to work in our lives, they're supposed to ask for consent. Like they're supposed to be a form of agreement. Just like uh, when God asked Abraham to what? When God was going to make a covenant with Abraham to make him the father of all nations, he first put him in a deep sleep and he gave him instructions. And when Abraham allowed, that is when God went ahead and did the work in his life. So I think it comes down to, yes, even if God has good things for us, but are we willing to let him work through us? Because it's going to be, at the end of it, it's going to come down to according to his will be done, not just what we want. That's, that's, that's what I have to share. Thank you, Maggie. Any other comments? On that question, still I'll do so. Okay, I'm I'm here. Yeah. Um. I think for me, I'll just refer to the Lord's Prayer. I would refer to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think really it's about us willing, eh? us allowing for the will of God to operate in us. Really like Maggie saying it, because when Jesus is teaching about prayer, that is, that is the guidance he provides. It is true God has a will for us. You know, it is true he has a plan for us. It's a good plan for us, a plan for a good end. But um, it takes us asking us, first of all, honoring God, you know, acknowledging his position in our lives, honoring him, you know, as our father, him that acts, you know, in heaven, and then us asking, allowing that he comes and operates, you know, our free will again. It's about us exercising our free will. I think that's really what God expects of us. So when somebody says, why must we pray? Why must we ask? He, he needs us to exercise our liberty, yeah, that he will come and operate. Otherwise, he has a plan for us. He has a will for us. Yeah, and it's a perfect will. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm going to pitch in here. Uh, everything that has been shared so far is true and correct. Uh, I just want to read a few verses and explain something critically important. I think at one point I had the same question and I'm going to share something that opened my eyes to that. But before I do, I'm going to share what I believe is again the revelation of the spirit that I've had at least two people in the response speaking here, which was my initial insight when you asked that question. There's a verse that says that the just shall live by his faith. Okay. Meaning that every time you become a person who follows after this God of Israel, you're classified in that class of people called the just. 
a life of just people, just like the example of Abraham that Maggie gave, they live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Okay? So that is what living by faith means. You, you, you hear and listen. What has God said about this issue? You live by that word. It amazes me that there are many times, I gave an example recently, that um, when the Gibeonites came to Israel, God knew they were Gibeonites. God knew they were lying to Joshua. Joshua never inquired of the Lord. God never tampered with him. He left him. And Joshua signed a covenant with these guys only to discover a few days later that he had made a permanent mistake that he could not reverse. Wasn't God aware? Of course, God was aware. So there is something about the setup that God has set in the world where he desires for us to inquire of him. You know, when there is issues, he needs us to find out. When God punished Israel for the Gibeonites, David was a man of God. He used to worship, giving sacrifices, but he had to first inquire of the Lord to understand what the problem was. You know, so every time we don't inquire of the Lord, um, we create a problem. It's not that God doesn't want to give us answers. It's not that he's not available to give us answers. He wants to give answers, but he wants relationship. And where there is relationship, you do not just behave as if your father has no opinion. You go and you ask for it. Where there is a need, you go and you ask. And if his, his issue is different, then he will tell you. Okay. Now let me read you a verse. Um, a verse that is in uh, Genesis. Yeah. Uh, I'm finding this, trying to find this verse. If somebody knows where it is, I think it might be Genesis chapter 3. There's a verse that says, when God created man, he gave him dominion over everything on earth and over all the earth. I am, for lack of, of time, I don't want to go and look for it, but there is that verse, either Genesis chapter 1 or chapter 2, I forget where it is. Genesis 1, 26, okay, my wife has showed me, let's go there. Genesis 1, 26. God said, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness. So in other words, when God created man, the first thing he gave to man he gave you part of himself. You know, that's why the right of Psalms writes somewhere and says we are gods. Because God gave you his likeness. You know, you can, um, you carry in you the character of God. And then, sorry, the, the image, it's more of the character of God. Then the likeness is more of the functionality of God. Yeah. So God first gave you those things as a human being. Then he says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Let me tell you in today's language what just happened in that verse. God, after creating man, he said, let us give man the chapa of earth and of all creation. I am using language that we can easily relate with. He gave us the chapa. He signed off the land title, transferred, and the transfer was completed. Now that has serious implications. And it is the very reason why shrines work. It is the very reason why demons operate on earth. It is the very reasons why witch doctors and witchcraft works. Uh, in that wickedness of it is the very reason why um, Satan has operation on earth. Why? Because when God gave human beings dominion, man dominion over all the earth and over everything creation, he transferred that authority to man for man to decide if man wants a demon to take over, he can go create an altar for it and call it to take over. And the only reason demons have authority on earth is that human beings invite them. 
there is no demon that has authority on earth that was not invited by a human being. So once you begin to get that concept, then you begin to understand that the same authority that God gave to man over all the earth and all creation, yeah, that same authority keeps God out of the picture. And that is why every time you don't invite God into your affairs, he will not force himself in because you hold the authority. That is the reason why you need to pray because prayer has the key to invite God in. Even God himself, for him to operate on earth through Jesus Christ, he had to request the authority of a woman to use her body and the, the, the seed is born of the woman. And he, he took on the flesh of human being, yeah? In order now to have authority to do certain things here directly as human being. That is why Jesus had so much power on earth. That is why you and I have so much power. When we accept Jesus Christ, we become direct agents of the kingdom of God here. So we have um, activated empowerment, yeah? So Mama Wanaswa asked if God knows our needs. Eh, the, the same question can be asked differently. That if, if the God is a loving God, why does he look when people are suffering and let them suffer? It is because everything happening on earth that has gone wrong, there is a human being that has exercised their authority wrongly and has invited the demonic into that space. And that is why you should never take altars lightly because those human beings are using their human authority to invite demonic altars in place. But it is the same authority we have when we put up godly altars, we welcome God back into to operate into the human space. It is because of that verse I showed you in Genesis 1, 26. So that's the same verse that will govern why when you have a need, and you want God's involvement, you go and ask him to get involved. But God always knows. And that is why when you don't inquire, he doesn't push his way there, you know? And when you inquire, he now tells you what you need to do. So the same, by the same token, dominion was given to man. And that dominion means man can choose to lock God out of his affairs. But also man can choose to open up affairs um of god but it is not entirely true that god is always quiet god still speaks to us in dreams in visions especially in this dispensation of the holy spirit there's a huge outpouring of that so there are even many things that god does even if we haven't invited him that we just have now to respond to pastor taka i see your hand up can you kindly make your comments yes thank you so much for your contribution uh, toward that question um, yes, now I think still on uh, to approach that question, we have also to understand what prayer is, because right here in Africa, prayer means to gain to sabi, to gain it to sabi means let's go and ask God and and maybe not beggars but sana kusaba, mukama tuzo kusaba. We have come, oh God, give us life protect us oh god we pray we ask you jesus come protect us so i think uh we still need to teach more about uh prayer the meaning of prayer yes you talked about a relationship that god is seeking looking for a relationship yes but uh, he, uh, and also someone else talked about uh faith that they just shall live by by faith Yes, if you look, if you go in the book of Matthew, I don't remember this chapter specifically, but there is somewhere Jesus said, if you happen to come and pray, do not repeat words. Hmm? Do not ask the same things. You're like, oh God, give me a house, give me a car, give me a land title, Sunday one, Sunday two, until the year ends. You are asking him for the same things. I think... Uh, uh, they just shall live by faith. It's just by knowing God, you know God, you understand he's a father. Actually, someone talked about, Madina talked about, it reminded us of what Pastor shared uh, a couple of weeks back uh, about uh, the sonship, being a son in the, 
in the house, if you can know that God is a father, uh, you think and we also know the concept of faith that is the Bible says they just shall live by faith. I think prayer, you know, uh, uh, when we pray, as in with the concept, with the perception of uh, like, like we are begging, we have come to ask God, God, meet our needs, uh, give me a land title. Oh God, I need a house, I need this and that. Somehow that, that does not really define who God is and to us. So I think um, it's not that God does not know our needs, but just wants us to discover, to realize who we are in, in the house. Uh, that takes us back to what Pastor Robert told us uh, uh, two weeks back. So thank you so much. That was my contribution. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Tucker. Mama Florence, I don't Great. know if those responses help. Yeah, they help. Um, I'll tell you what the concept I used. I used uh, the prodigal son and the other son. So I told her, you know, everyone thinks the prodigal son was the bad one, but actually he was the good one because he, for him, he understood I'm a child. Let me ask for my things. But the other one who was working so hard, doing everything right and so on, he, I don't know what he expected the father to do, but instead of going to the father and say, today we want to celebrate, and we need this and this, he just kept quiet. Then I also told him that you see Job's children, Job's children understood they were children of, the, of a rich guy. So they would just tell the father, today we are parting at so-and-so's place and he would allow them. So I told her, you know, you can be there because she's really, really devoted. She prays by the way, she communicates well, but she believed that if she needs rent, because you live by faith, God should just know that you are faithful and the rent comes or someone calls her and says, come and pick money. She best, best needs, she never prays for them. Mm. She, she says God will bring them at his own time, but he, she never asked. So I, when I gave her that concept, she says, by the way, I have always looked at the prodigal son and that one who squandered, who, is, who misbehaved and so on. I had never looked at that aspect. So she said, eh, I think I better start asking God because my things might be there. I am here working hard for him. I'm praying for people. I'm, she's doing everything except asking God for her needs. She's waiting that God will just supply her needs without her asking. So thank you all for your contributions. Tomorrow I'm going to add more on our discussion today and I think she will be delivered. Wow, thank you so much. And as we conclude this session today, I just want to emphasize something about this last question and the verse that has been repeated most of all, the one that says, the just shall live by his faith. Again, there's another verse that I pointed to yesterday in relation to that, which says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So when you pray and you inquire of the Lord over your situation, you hear what God's response is, and that is be, becomes the basis for faith. And then you're able to have a way to move forward. So I just thought it was important to just wrap it up that way. Thank you everyone that has asked those questions and for everyone that has contributed in today's discussion. And Father, we thank you that you have uh, blessed us with your word because your word is life. It is the bread of life. Your word um, brings light. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. We ask you that you may continue speaking to us and teaching us your ways. And may your presence continually be with us. Bless us. We commit the revival week into your hands. We pray that Father surprise us wonderfully in those days of the revival week. And tonight as we get to our beds, we ask for your presence. We ask you to surround us. We ask you that, Lord, your presence may be with us throughout. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
And God bless you all. Have a good night. Have a good night too. Thank you, Pastor. Amina. <laughs>